So I was working in Maria Harrison's lab uh, this summer um, uh, with my mentor, Brian Emmett, as George said. And we were looking at bacterial communities within the hyphosphere of AMF, or arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So let me first introduce uh, the ecological issue that our, my research kind of stems from. Um, in today's agricultural settings, we use uh, excess phosphorus in our fertilizers. Um, and this causes a variety of negative impacts, one of them being algal blooms. Um, and I liked, uh, I wanted to show you some uh, recent examples. Um, there's actually one in Cayuga Lake that was reported this July. And there was one um, uh, within the coast off of Finland, within the Baltic Sea. And they're actually seeing the highest rate of algal blooms within decades. And they both are hypothesized to be from agricultural runoff with excess phosphorus. But overall, how does our research into these bacterial colonies that associate with AMF relate? Well, let me first give you your AMF background. So AMF are a type of endomycorrhizal fungi that actually invade the cortex of plant cells. Um, and they form these tree-like arbuscules. Actually, let me dim the lights here. You can see those better. Um, these arbuscules here. And they're the site of the nutrient acquisition between the plant and the fungi. Um, about 70% of terrestrial plants actually hold this relationship, and it provides the plant with a variety of things, specifically nutrients, and in particular phosphorus. So this is kind of where it relates to our um, environmental issues. Um, it also can provide the plant with drought tolerance and bioprotection. That's kind of more recent research that we've found. Um, and then overall, uh, this relationship has been held uh, since the Devonian period. So it's something that has been chosen for through natural selection through time. So this is the fungi. And let me give you your background then on the bacteria that associate with this fungi. So overall, we know that there are these particular bacterial communities um, that associate with the fungi. And they, the ones we're studying are actually living in the hyphosphere. So the hyphosphere is labeled in pink here. And it's the area surrounding the hyphae of the fungi. Um, and this relationship can lead to um, impacts for the fungi and for the bacteria, but one of the biggest is that the fungi is able to solubilize forms of phosphorus that may have been unattainable previously without the bacteria interaction. Um, it increases nitrogen fixation and it increases uh, decomposition of soil organic matter as well. So that's the fungi, that's the bacteria. And overall, my lab actually has started looking into this interaction between the two. This is some of the preliminary work that they did before I got here, um, our tree made by Brian, my mentor. Um, so overall, we've seen, um, let me explain this to you here. These are three types of soils, and these are all the orders within preliminary sequencing that they have found, uh, preliminary sequencing of the 16S RNA gene. Um, and the circles here, all these colored circles, are OTUs, or Operational Taxonomic Unit 97% or above identities. So you can see here kind of some of the hits that we had some of within some of the orders. So we want to take this preliminary data and compare it to our sequencing data and see what we find. So overall, our objectives of the entire study are to better understand this relationship. We want to dig more into this relationship between the bacteria and the fungi. And we want to create a culture library so then my lab can use these bacterial isolates that we find and use them for um, future studies. Um, and like I said in the previous slide, we want to compare that preliminary sequencing data to sequencing data that we get just to see the differences. Um, this was a cool picture. We actually, Brian actually fluoresced some of the hyphae and then what we, we think are some of the bacterial colonies right there, those little um, blue dots fluorescing, so it gives you a visual of where we're looking at. Okay, so some of our methods. Before I got to BTI, my plants were already growing. Um, they were two brachypodium within a uh, plastic core um, growing, and then after seven weeks, we actually added a soil core. So that's this picture right up here. And this mesh core actually contained soil, and the plants themselves were actually only growing in a sand-gravel mixture. So we inserted the cores, and after um, seven more days, we actually started harvesting. We harvested our hyphae. And we decided to actually harvest hyphae from two of the compartments. We wanted to harvest hyphae from this core, and this hyphae is in direct contact with soil. 
And then we wanted to also compare it to hyphae that was not in contact with soil and that was actually found in the roots of the sand soil mixture. So we extracted hyphae from the cores and then we put the plant roots out on a plate and extracted the hyphae manually as well. Um, and just to comment, this actually takes a lot of time to get enough material to actually sequence. The hyphae is very fragile. It's very hard to find, um, lots of time over a microscope. So once we collected enough hyphae, we were able to take it, sonicate it, and vortex it to knock off those bacterial colonies. We were, made serial dilutions, and then we spread them over media. Um, and we get plates that look like this. So we get multiple colonies with on one plate. And we go through a series of isolations to get all these particular colonies isolated and ready for our sequencing. So after there, we confirm that they're pretty much isolated. We take them through PCR, um, and we do our 16S rRNA sequencing. Um, some of the media specifically that we use to allow for the greatest diversity was TSA. We use 10%. TSA, we use R2A. They're both dilute, non-selective media to allow for a great diversity of isolates. And they were all incubated at room temperature. After the series of four harvests, we actually have 210 collected isolates. Um, so we have a lot more, actually, that can be sequenced. And so of the ones that we have sequenced so far, this is some of our results. Um, we separated them by root hyphae and core hyphae results here, as you can see. And the, um, the kind of big point here to look at is the root and core hyphae at the order level, because these are all sequencing results on the order level, are very similar. You can see that most of the pies are actually shared. Each piece that is pulled out is shared between the two of the orders. Um, but when you look at the uh, genre level, Overall, there's much more diversity. These, are, these numbers are showing how many unique isolates are found between root and core hyphae. So they're, they're very unique at the uh, genre level. They only share five uh, genera. Um, but at the order level, they are more similar. So we wanted to compare the root and the core hyphae um, results. But we also wanted to compare the results over the harvest. How are these isolates changing over time? Are we getting more diversity over time, or are we uh, kind of getting the same isolate each harvest? We actually saw that we're getting diversity over time. What it what seems as though is we have a lot of similar species as time goes on. On the third harvest, we actually found three that we actually also found in harvest one, uh, Bacillus megatherium being one of them, Acidovorax delftia being another. Um, and we can see that the percentage of similarity or similar isolates is going down through time, concluding maybe that diversity is shown over multiple harvests over a time series. And then so back to the uh, preliminary uh, data that we wanted to compare to. So we took our isolates that hit these particular OTUs, which are again the circles, uh, the colored circles, and we labeled the ones that matched with yellow stars here. Um, and then we looked at these uh, OTUs. Are these OTUs directly from the root hyphae, or are they from the core? And we found actually that 16 of the isolates were from that, that matched these OTUs from the preliminary um, were actually part of the root hyphae. So concluding that maybe the root hyphae compartment is where we want to direct more of our research because it matches more of the preliminary data, the stuff we're kind of interested in looking at. So to just sum up all of our points here, um, we created this culture library, which I think was the biggest impact of our study. So now my, my lab can take these isolates and use them with any other experiments that they want to look at within this, within this interaction. Um, when we compared the root and the core hyphae results, sequencing results, we see that the order level, a lot of similarities, genre level, not as many similarities, more uniqueness. Um, we, we see that harvesting over time allows for greater diversity. And then we also, again, like in the last side, the root hyphae might be that better representation. It might be where we want to put our focus instead of the core hyphae as it matches the preliminary data a little bit more. Okay, so overall, we have this cultural library, which really was the biggest goal that we had to make this cultural library. And we can start to ask various other questions regarding this relationship between AMF and these bacterial communities, such as 
do, does this particular isolate, let's say Bacillus megatherium, does this inhibit the growth of the hyphae? Does it facilitate the growth of the hyphae? Does it enhance the nutrient acquisition between the two? So these are all questions that we can ask around each separate isolate itself. And then how does it really relate to improving our soil management is kind of what the goal, end applied goal might be. Um, in theory, we could probably add AMF and the correct microbial isolates to allow for the greatest amount of nutrient acquisition by plants. So our plants could maximize the amount of nutrients that they obtain by allowing this AMF bacterial community interaction that can increase the amount of phosphorus intake. Um, we can sustain phosphorus better. As we know, it's a limited nutrient as we're running out of phosphate rock to mine from. Um, and it leads to better fertility overall of the soil. So I just want to thank everybody in my lab. Everybody was super welcoming. Of course, Maria and Brian helping me out every step of the way. Delaney, I asked her a million and a half questions this whole time. So thank you, Delaney. Um, and everybody in the lab has helped me with various things. I was kind of all over the place the first few weeks. So thank you for everybody for helping me out. And I will take any questions. Yeah, so it, yeah, it is a biased culture library, right? Because we're, we're missing a lot of the, of the particular isolates that may have not grown on our media or maybe didn't grow under the certain conditions, the incubation temperatures and such. So with more time, you know, we could re recreate this and gain more isolates, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so because my cores were already inserted, I'm not direct, I don't know. It's natural soil growth. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, natural soil, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if, so you said that you're part way through sequencing the, the culture library. About what percentage of the way through are oh. you? And yeah. do you think that once you complete that, you'll still see that pattern of um, increasing diversity over time? Your yeah. So that's a good point. Um, so we have done three of, we've harvested four times. We have had four harvests. We've only sequenced up to the third harvest. The fourth harvest, I'm kind of leaving for my mentor. So he's gonna have a lot of sequencing work to do. Um, but yeah, we, we may see the, the trends change. Um, my theory would be that still you're gaining diversity over time, um, but we'll see, I guess. So we probably have like 50 to 75% of the isolates uh, sequenced. more questions, let's thank Samantha and all the speakers. <laughs>